One of the reasons why we're meeting today is we're doing <laughs> You make me sweat always like crazy. Yes. That's in the gym. Try. So now try not to make me sweat over here. Okay. Okay? Try. Oh yeah. Okay. Nick is a two-time Olympian. He's been in judo for over 10 years. 25 years. 25 years. So I was a member of the national team for 10 years, but I started judo for, well, it's been almost 30 years actually. Okay. You grew up in Ontario. You moved uh, to Quebec when? I moved to Quebec when I was 19. Okay. Yeah, I'm 38 now, so I guess almost 20 years. Wow, 20 years. Yeah. That's amazing. And uh, would you have uh, liked to move somewhere else in the world, or do you think Quebec was the right place for you? Uh, well, I mean, I didn't really have a choice. Uh, National Training Center was here, so okay. I wanted to pursue that aspect of my, uh, my athletics. And amazing. This was kind of the centralization in Canada, so we moved. Everybody moves to Montreal, and it was very competitive at that point because if all the athletes were coming over here, getting their training and yeah, competing, it's tough because uh, you're training with the people that you actually have to beat. Right. Um, but with the world ranking system, it's basically your international results that count the most. Okay. Well, how does the ranking work in judo? Is, is it like karate? Like you know, you have your the belt system. The tier Very system? similar to karate. I don't know exactly the every karate, jujitsu, judo, okay. taekwondo has their own system. Um, but ours just goes like white, yellow, orange, green, blue, brown, and then black. And, and then, then black. there's different degrees of black belt. And um, but when you're on a on or focused on the competitive aspect, you're not really focused so much on like, oh, I want to be a six degree black belt. Right. It doesn't really mean anything. Okay. Uh, at that level, we're just most of the athletes are just focused on competition, and normally those degrees just kind of get given to you over time. I, I've always wanted to know, like, has a blue belt, not even blue belt, has a yellow belt ever been able to take down a black belt? For sure, because you have competitive and right. uh, recreational judo, uh, judo players. Okay. So you'll have like maybe a guy that was uh, a wrestler um, that went over, that was a competitive wrestler that right. started doing judo. Right. So he had some understanding of takedowns um, or you just have a very recreational black belt. So what's the most uh, difficult and hardest, I'd say, uh, martial arts sport to learn and to do? Um, tai Chi? Any, definitely not. Okay. <laughs> uh, any grappling sport, I think, is the toughest because there's so many aspects to it. So, judo, jiu-jitsu, wrestling, sambo. Okay. Um, and then there's always the, the debate of what is best. And I think it just de depends on your style if you're going into MMA. Right. Um, or whatever. MMA, if you guys don't know, is mixed martial arts. Yes. Right? Yes. I know that much. <laughs> That's good. Uh, as far as... Uh, uh, us meeting. I'll kind of give that background. Uh, my wife and I, during COVID times, were looking for a place to work out because, of course, all of us were in great shape at that point. And uh, we stumbled onto this sign. Yeah, right? Trend performance. Trend performance. Yeah. And uh, I called all of a sudden, did my thing, and started talking to Nick. And uh, we hit it off right away. Yeah. And we got personal training. Now our kids are learning judo from some of his instructors and him. And uh, we train there at least uh, five times a week. <laughs> <laughs> They're there twice a week. <laughs> and then their kids are there twice yes, a week. Exactly. Yeah. It's been uh, a game changer for, for me and I know my wife Mita as well. We never imagined that we're going to be going into a judo uh, you know, gym to work out. <laughs> yeah, never yeah. thought that, that was us. Right, we were we were more the people that would go, you know, cross fitness, that kind of stuff, or yeah. or regular gyms. But th this was the best move we ever made, and uh, you know, you, it's been amazing so far. Uh, now, I wanna I wanna touch on a topic. I know we talk, we joke around this a lot at the gym sometimes when we're working out and training. Uh, you've traveled the world yeah. uh, through judo and uh, through all the competitions worldwide, right? So, uh, what were some of your favorite places? I know we talked about Japan was one of your favorite places. Yeah. Um, um, Favorite places to travel. Uh, I spent a lot of time in Holland when I was younger, so I like the Netherlands. Uh, great country, right. and uh, Japan. But I mean, each each country has uh, good things and bad things about it. Just like our country has good things and bad things about it. And, and then Japan. Uh, did you guys win any medals there? Uh, yeah. Uh, there's a well. We already, always go there to train. Okay. They're like. Uh, 
kind of like how ho- how hockey is here in Canada. Okay. Uh, Japan judo is the same thing. So they're the powerhouse. Uh, they're the powerhouse country, and uh, so a lot of countries go over there to cross train with them. Understand their their kind of mentality behind training, uh, the, how how often they train, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, the hardest um, Grand Slam for judo mm-hmm. is the Tokyo Grand Slam. And the reason why it's the hardest one is that you have four Japanese in each division. Normally at a Grand Slam event, uh, each country is allowed to have one representative per weight division. Okay. Um, but the host nation gets to throw four. Um, so you'll have more multiple chances. Japanese in the division, which is like having a basically four top players in the world mm-hmm. in that division. So generally, you know, in each division, Japan is, you know, two, three people on the podium mm-hmm. is in Japan. So we did this tournament before. I have two medals at this tournament, uh, two Grand Slam medals at that event. And um, there's only one other Canadian to ever place twice at that event as well. You've uh, you've had a chance to, you know, while you were growing up, probably ex- experiment and explore different sports. How did you come across judo and why, why did you choose judo to excel in in your career it's funny because like i come from like the middle of nowhere ontario right um like the closest town to me was 600 people oh wow so um that's where i went to school um but there was a local judo club that was in the school okay and uh basically my dad wanted me to like learn how to control my temper Mm -hmm. i was always getting in trouble so he was like all right you're gonna do judo and uh, I loved it when I first started. And Amazing. I did I did play a lot of sports back in that time. Um, kids weren't specializing such at such a young age mm-hmm. as they are now, which I think is better, makes a better athlete if they like to try different sports and, you know. And see what. Just, just allows a kid to develop better motor sure. skills. Even if they, I say, hey, judo is my sport. But I do gymnastics, soccer, basketball, football, baseball, whatever. I'm developing other motor function skills, which will ultimately help help the sport that I want to be in. Sure, um, makes sense. So, uh, yeah, I chose that at a, at a young age, but I played a lot of other sports. And then I had to make that decision when I was uh, 19 or 18, actually, what if I wanted to be go for wrestling or for judo because I was Mm -hmm. national champion in wrestling at the same time I was national champion in judo. A lot of factors of um, basically wrestling Canada versus judo Canada. What does judo offer? What does wrestling offer? Am I going to be able to go as far uh, as I want in one sport or the other? Mm -hmm. And ultimately I chose uh, judo. So Uh, you came to Montreal in 2002. Yeah, two thousand has to be two thousand three, around two thousand three. So at that time, yeah. you you were here for training and specializing yeah. in your skills, right? So yeah. you had no intention of opening up your facility, your gym. No, not and, at all. And how did you stumble <laughs> upon that? And what happened? Because you know we all have different stories in life where certain things happen. One door closes, multiple yeah. open up. So was it a situation like that for you? A lot of doors closed. Okay. So in two thousand twelve, it was a terrible year for me. I was winning everything 2011, you know, in my mind, okay, I'm going to the Olympics, I'm winning a medal, and uh, I'm going to ride off into the sunset. Right, you know? retire. And um, I had my second kid in 2012, which was great. I got injured, sorry. Um, and one of the reasons I got injured, unbeknownst to me, was that my immune system was very weak at that time. I wasn't sure what was wrong. I had either stomach cancer or Crohn's disease. Okay. So like I was losing a lot of weight, still trying to train. And um, obviously, luckily enough, I got diagnosed with Crohn's disease. Right. But within that time period, I was like breaking down a little bit. It was like six months of just like, okay. Of course, when it's unknown. I'm not feeling great. Right. You're you're still trying to, you know, press the gas into the Olympics. And um, I hurt my back. Right. Right. Before the Olympics. And so I was stuck in Paris. I had two herniated discs in my back. And I was like, okay. So you're in Paris uh, for a competition? Training camp. Training camp. Wow. Good. And I was like, okay, what, uh, what's, what's, what am I going to do? Right. So they were like, Nick, you're not going to qualify for the Olympics. Um, well, you're qualified, but we don't think you're going to be able to potentially be your best, which right. I wasn't. You know, I did end up 
still being able to function enough to compete at the Olympics, but I didn't have a great performance. Um, I lost to a guy that was third in the world, very good player, but uh, I had never lost to him before. So right. in judo, it's a single elimination tournament, like a tennis draw almost. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was out. I got diagnosed, had my second kid. Everything was good. Got diagnosed with Crohn's disease, herniated two discs in my back. Oh my God. Then uh, came back from the Olympics, went through a separation, and then got fired from my job. Wow. And I was like, what the f Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, what then what else? Right what now? else, universe? And I was looking at it and I was like, you know what? I'm like, I got to just push sport aside because we don't make a lot of money in judo. And I made that decision to just retire. Okay. Was it a good decision? Looking back on it, I think it was the right decision to make because I had two young kids. You know, I need to take care of these of kids. Course. Like, I don't want to be that, you know, Olympic champion with, uh, two kids of that course. I don't know. Um, so, uh, made that decision to retire. And then I was like, okay, well, what am I going to do? And right. then for two years I played poker cause that's what we did on tour. We were right. playing a lot of online poker. We're traveling all over the world. And you did well. Made, you said. Yeah. Made, yeah. Made like a career of that for two years Amazing. while I was trying to figure out what I was, what I wanted to do. My dad was starting a very big project in Ontario. He's a construction worker and he asked if I wanted to be, uh, he needed some help on it. Right. So I was like, okay, man, I stopped the poker, took a more, uh, serious guess, path, serious path. Mm -hmm. um, but I felt because I had kids here, okay, I'm going to be staying in Montreal. What am I going to really do in Montreal? I don't want to keep driving home every week, only home on weekends of course. during construction. And then the idea to start the personal training business was was brought to me by some people that were like, hey, Nick, like we would love to train with you. And then we just started with uh, with in-gym private training sessions. At same location? Uh, I was at another uh, location, just kind of renting space from that. Okay. Gym. Yeah. Some doors close, one opens up or a couple open up. Yeah. Exactly. I think we, we, we've all been there. And you know, they always say uh, very successful people have made it and lost it all multiple times before they make it back again and they really appreciate it. Yep, for sure. Uh, similar stories. So uh, it was uh, touching and yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but good came out of it, right? And now you have five children. Yep. And kids. they're all uh, training as well. Yeah, the little one the is little ones. a little hesitant. But, she's at the uh, gym a lot. Yeah, she's at the gym a lot. Yeah. Yeah. So she's being brought up in that environment as well. She gives uh, shit to all the... Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And uh, I think uh, the eldest is uh, the highest rank right now, in the belt was. Yeah, Emma is the highest ranked. She started judo basically when she could walk. Amazing. I'm taking a little bit different path with the younger one. Right. Because I butted heads with Emma for... Right. 10 years about doing judo i had a system in place to make her an olympian right and it was to do judo and gymnastics and then swimming and just weed out gymnastics slowly as she transitioned into judo and uh yeah that that was a fight yeah but it worked <laughs> out it worked out it worked out That's uh, it's good, and she likes it now, right? Yeah. Well, she still fights with me. A yeah. Bit, but she got no choice. <laughs> she has no choice now. You're all in. Kid. Yeah, I know. <laughs> if somebody wants to get into judo or thinking of getting into a uh, uh, some sort of a sport, and judo comes up, and you see a sign, and you know you end up calling, is judo good for any age group to start or younger? Uh, youngest possible. Uh, I, I mean, so like our youngest that we accept is like three. Okay, wow, okay. three is young. And that's a kinder judo program. So that's just like learning how mm -hmm. to move your body. Yeah. We call it, it's kinder judo. It's more like gymnastics, judo. Cotton uh, candy, learn, lollipops, learn, yeah, exactly. I get it. Yeah, they learn perfect. how to fall, they learn how to roll. And gymnastics does the same thing. Right. They have like kinder gymnastics, the kids learn how to hang on a bar. Amazing. Roll, and it's the same type of thing, but just kind of a little bit geared to more judo. And then when the kids get to about seven to eight, they start doing judo a little bit more seriously, maybe like twice a week. As we saw my kids uh, yeah, transitioning. Exactly. Yeah, transition. Um, but we do have lots of 30-year-olds, 35-year-olds that, yeah. that start uh, judo. 
but we kind of gear it more to that age group. So but, like, and it's a good workout. They're not going to go and rumble with Simo and yes. Renan and these right. guys, but uh, they will work on their own path. What advice do you have for people from outside of Canada or people in, uh, in Canada or within Quebec wanting to start a business in Quebec? Don't do it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Why not? Do you think the political sphere is good in Quebec right now? <laughs> Be honest. It's all good. Uh, so I think just the po political side of things ruins it for businesses. Uh, you could come in and, you know, I can have somebody that comes in and only speaks Arabic and I'm going to try my best to, you know, right. French, English, German, Spanish, whatever it is. And I think that's how it should be. There's too much emphasis on this language rule and language mm -hmm. barrier, like 50% or more than 50% of all your signs in your gym need to be French. Well, what if my clientele is Japanese? Right. You know, so there we tend to say that Canada is a multicultural and normally we are very multicultural. Mm -hmm. If you go downtown in Montreal, you're going to find every other person is a mm -hmm. different uh, race or ethnicity or mm -hmm. nationality. And... Uh, but here we have to be French. We got to protect the French language, um, which is a little ridiculous because French wasn't even the first language here. So yeah. <laughs> well, if you go <laughs> back down the history we rabbit hole, we don't go down the the history enough of history it. rabbit hole. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's a great province. I think uh, people want to have more businesses within Montreal, but it's tough. You see people literally leaving mm -hmm. Montreal or Quebec in general. Because uh, the taxes are too high. I just had uh, a friend of mine and her family mm -hmm. move to Alberta. Wow. Because they were like, we can't get ahead here. And the funny thing is I moved you back moved from <laughs> yeah. Alberta over here in uh, 2017. Yeah. Well, look, okay. Uh, you were saying 2002-ish, 4-ish, you were here, right? Yeah. At that time, the political landscape in Quebec was kind of gearing up for basically pushing people out again. Yeah. Okay, a lot of stuff happened that time, and I have to go back into my records to see what it was. And I remember we were seeing a lot more advertisements around 2005, 6, and 7 of, of, of saying, come to Alberta. It's, uh, it's booming over here. Yeah, yeah. And Alberta was going through a boom at that time. Calgary was as well. So I moved out in 07. So I know that a lot of people were leaving. Did you notice that when you were coming in? No, but I mean, uh, there was... Uh Generally speaking, you're coming to Quebec. The national team was a strong right, Quebec and you're focused. team. You're focused on this. Yep. But there was some people, and I remember there was a couple people at the judo club, and one in particular, she would always say, like, on parle français ici, ici c'est Quebec. And I looked at her, I said, look around. Yeah. I said, the entire <laughs> team is not French. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, you know, I'm fine to speak French. My mom is French, you know, like, yeah. uh, but... You know, putting that emphasis on you have to speak French, that's what puts the bad taste in everybody's mouth. You shouldn't have to speak any language that you aren't, you know. It's, it's a fine edge sword, this, this topic. And, you know, it can be right on either side. And I look I'm at more it more than happy to speak French. I know, no and, and, and I, I know we we yeah. we haven't spoken French with each other, but, <laughs> but around people around us. Yeah. Around, but what, what I'm saying is, I've seen and I've uh, you know being out west, living there for almost ten years, looking at Montreal and Quebec from the outside in. What I noticed uh, was that protecting the French language, the way they are, it's a little bit intense, but was also a positive thing for. Montreal, because Quebec would have lost its identity, and the identity would would become more Canadian at that point, which a lot of people in Quebec would think yes, and a lot of people right now are going to be like, what the hell is Danny saying? But uh, just hear me out for a second. <laughs> Quebec and uh, all the cities in Quebec would become a Canadian city, so it'll be easy, you know, just thinking going, going to a Mississauga, all the signs are in English. So at least they're controlling the signage. They're controlling certain things that leave the identity and the appeal of French and yeah, of Quebec. Yeah, but we're Quebec. not talking about changing the provincial signs. Okay. We're talking about individual businesses. Language. I pay taxes. Right. This is my business. Right. I can write scribbles on the wall if I want. It's in any me. language. It's me. Yeah. I'm yeah, paying I agree. for it. And then you're coming in and you're fining businesses. Right. Well, how come Chinatown isn't getting fired? Exactly. Oh, but they have their own thing. Okay, but it makes no sense, guys. No, no, Either you're right. go 
one direction or the other. That's the problem in Quebec. Is it's a fine it's line. like loop de loop of uh, just political backwards. gibberish. <laughs> backwards. Yeah. You know, so that, I think that's what makes people. I don't honestly. I don't like politics at all. I don't even no. care to like pay attention. People are like, "Oh, I can't believe Legault got what, back in." I'm like, "What do you, what do you say? You have no time. Care. You have no time. I have no time. <laughs> I'm busy." That's our famous line. When they, I want to go to the gym, I have no time. <laughs> The future of your business, do you see yourself expanding further? Right now, you you know, I mean, I want to congratulate you on your success because you had a smaller gym and now you took over the other side as well, yes. which basically doubled, or if not almost tripled in size. It added another right. portion or another separate aspect to the gym, right? Um, which I think was good because it now separates the personal training. But, but, but I commend you because, you know, I've, we're hearing rhetoric out there that a lot of gyms are shutting down because they can't keep up with the times and here you are a brave soldier <laughs> yeah. who is expanding you know which is great it's good to see that yeah i think um right now it's it happened very fast right so i'm still trying to i feel like the roadrunner trying to keep up with my feet a of little course bit. um there's a lot of aspects of the gym that is this size to manage and maintain sure. from trainers and coaches and making sure everybody's happy Make sure, sure the clientele is happy. Um, but yeah, it's going in the right direction. I don't see myself expanding unless it's to another location. Location, like franchise. Another, yeah, exactly. Um, but I'm not even sure about the franchise aspect just because I'm not somebody that wants to franchise to make money. I want to have a quality product there. Please. So even if I leave somebody in charge of there, my OCD is going to take over. I'm sure. not going to be like, well, how come this this place isn't, you know, at the level that I want it to be sure. at? So I think just in that regard, I'll keep Triton Performance. And then maybe if I expand, it will be like Triton Condos or something. Yeah. <laughs> something. Visionary, um, I like that. The other thing that, that, that came to mind was, I want to kind of give you an idea, uh, not an idea, I want to tell you why I thought of creating this content was important. Okay. And I saw something online, uh, it was Patrick Bet David, and he basically said he would pay anything to go see his grandparents or his grandfather in the past conduct business and do stuff. So, you know, and leaving a legacy behind for your grandchildren to see what grandpa was like on a day-to-day -day basis, it's amazing that the future children can do that and will be able to see this. So this is kind of one of the reasons of why I'm taking that path of creating this content. Oh, that's cool. And I wanted you in, in the journey with I me. I appreciate that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so Nick, thank you so much. Thank you very much. If anyone much. wants to work out or really learn from the best, look up Triton Performance and we'll give you a tour together. Sounds good. All right. <laughs>